Hello, everybody. My name is Maiola. It's my honor to bring you the word today. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand and we will get one to you. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 35. You're going to want a Bible. You're going to want to follow along. We go uh, line by line here. And we're going through a lot of verses today. So you definitely want a Bible to follow along and make sure I'm not preaching heresy up here. Yep. All right, so quick recap from um, last time I got to teach, we were in the Psalms, we were in Psalm 34, and Psalm 34 is unique in that David writes this Psalm after he has to pretend to be crazy to kind of save his life. You guys remember he's drooling on himself and graffiti on the gate and things like that, and from that came this beautiful Psalm of worship. It was praise and honor and glory to God, celebrating everything that he's done, and it was a good like praise Psalm, it was exciting. Psalm 35 is not that Psalm. Psalm 35 is what we call a psalm of lament. And a psalm of lament is not one that's going to be happy, happy, joy, joy. It's going to be a lot of like pain and suffering. But there's a lot that we can learn from lament. And so uh, here's some definitions I have for you guys of what lament is. Lament is a form of praise and prayer with the intent of drawing close to God in times of great suffering. So a psalm of lament is a psalm that is written through a time of suffering. It is meant to draw us near to God. This is another definition. Lament is the wailing of the heart before a God who hears, who listens, and who responds to our cries. Now, these definitions came from uh, an article from the Gospel Coalition. I've actually linked that in my notes, so if you want to go and check out that article, when they publish my notes, that link will be there for you, all right? But I want us to understand what lament is, and so we can do it properly, because the, the church, I think, has forgotten how to lament well. I think we kind of do one of two things. When we're going through times of suffering, we try to like get out of them as quickly as possible or just like just look to the future hope and kind of forget what's going on. But if we look at um, the Psalms, the Psalms are like the built-in hymnal that we have in scripture, right? I want you guys to see how much of the Psalms are lament. Check out this picture. And so in the top right, the top right over there, that's all Psalms of lament. Look at how much of the book of Psalms is taken up by that, right? Now, a lot of these are written by David, and what I'm trying to point out is this. We love to praise and worship God. We love to focus on joy and hope, as we should, but we cannot forget what it means to lament, and to lament well. There are going to be things that we go through, that loved ones we have go through, that the world is going through, and if we cannot weep with them, if we cannot cry with them and celebrate with them, if we cannot even cry over what we're going through, we got to readjust. I've had many people say to me, well, I think crying is for people who are weak. To which I say, watch your mouth, my Jesus wept. (laughs) See, there are times when we lament because we feel, because we love, because we care, because we're hurt, and that is okay. It's good if we can lament well. And that is what we wanna see here in this Psalm today. Now, this one is a Psalm of David. And I bring this up because we need to understand if anybody knows what it's like to suffer and still praise God, it is David. I want you to think about this man's life. David was uh, an adulterer. He, he murdered somebody and then he got judgment on his firstborn son. His firstborn son died because of his own sin. And then the rest of his kids are messed up. One of them kills the other one. And then that same kid tries to overthrow David. David has to go to war with his own son and his son ends up dying. And then when he tries to mourn his son's death, his boys are on him going, bro, what are you doing? He's fought against you. David's life is surrounded by war and strife and civil war. He is hiding in the caves of the mountains because King Saul is trying to hunt him down. David knows what it means to suffer. David knows what it means to have strife. And David knows what it is to praise God. Lamenting is an art that if we can master, we will have such compassion for the people around us and we will suffer so well. And I want us to understand There are two ways that David um, is going to show us how to suffer, not just in this psalm, but in his life. There is lament because of our own sin, things that we've done, ways that we've hurt people, ways that we need to grow. And there is lament because of sin done to us or because we live in a sinful world. This psalm in particular is one where David stands righteous, so it is not his own sin that he's lamenting over, but is the sins of those against him. Now, if you're a person, someone has sinned against you. If you are breathing here, someone has done wrong to you, and there are different ways to respond to that. What I want us to see is how a man of God, after his own heart, responds to his enemies coming against him. So David is innocent here, and the big thing that I want us to see is even in sorrow and lament, God is our rescuer. God is always 
our rescuer. And he is faithful and we can trust in him to rescue us. So before we dive into the psalm, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the beauty of your word. And that you are not a God who calls us to reject or pretend like our emotions aren't there, like our pain is not there, Lord. You actually encourage us to walk through those things with you. Through our suffering, we share in the sufferings of Christ and we can be rejoicing in you through these things, celebrating you in these things, Lord. And none of our pain is wasted because of you. You bring purpose to everything that we go through. If there's anyone here today, Lord, who is hurting, who is in pain, who is in a time of lamentation, would you bless them? Would you show them who you are? Would you give them anchors to hold fast to? Teach us as sons and daughters of Christ how to love you, how to care for you, how to love each other, how to care for each other. Bless us, Lord, as we come to this word. Speak clearly to us. If there's anyone here who does not know you, would today be the day of salvation for them, that we would rejoice with the angels in heaven at the one who has come home. Bless me, Lord, as your son. Let all that I say bring you honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so again, we're in Psalm chapter 35. Find me at the top there. This is a prayer for rescue from enemies. It is a Psalm of David, and it starts like this. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of buckler and shield. Rise up for my help. Draw also the spear and the battle axe to meet those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Now notice how David starts this psalm. He's asking God to move, to do something, right? Look at all those words. Those are all action words. Draw, take up, come, be my helper, fight, contend, right? So he's asking to God to come and fight for him. Now why is this important? David is a man who knows what it is to fight. David is a man who knows what it is to fight well. He is a warrior such that they would sing in the streets of this man. David has slain his ten thousands. It's not like this dude is afraid to scrap anybody. But when his enemies come against him, David is a man who understands and knows he never fights on his own strength. And so even this man who has slain Goliath, who has killed lions and bears with his bare hands, who has slain armies in front of him in the name of God, when his enemies come against him, he stops and he says, God, you fight for me. Lord, would you contend for me? Would you defend me? Would you take up your buckler, your shield? The buckler is a small shield. The shield is a big shield. So he's basically saying, bring your small shield, your big shield, all your weapons, everything. Come. Fight for me, God. The battle belongs to the Lord. If David himself will not fight his own battles on his own strength, then we should never even try. Because none of us scrap like David. I don't care where you grew up or how banger you think you is. Nobody fights like David, and if he won't fight his battles on his own strength, neither should we. He is dependent upon God to fight for him. Lord, come in your battle armor fully loaded and fight my enemies. Now, David has enemies who are seeking his life. The king is hunting him down. The king's army is hunting him down. He's got enemies who are saying all these weird things about him. They're trying to look for him. I don't think any of us have enemies like that. If you do, our prayer team will be on the side after. Please come and let us know so we can be praying for you. Now, we may not have enemies like that, but we have enemies. We have people who maybe don't like us, people who wish ill of us, people who speak ill of us, and even if it's not people, we have enemies. We have sin that crouches at the door seeking to devour us. This is what God said to Cain. Sin is at the door and its desire is for you. You must master it. We have an enemy in Satan. The one who stands to accuse us, the one who stands to tempt us and to bait us into sin. He's a devouring lion seeking someone to consume. But God is the Almighty. And God stands to defend his children. And so no matter who or what your enemy, you can, like David, pray, Lord, contend with those who contend with me. Fight those who fight against me. Take up your armor, your weapons, your power, Lord, and fight on my behalf. God is a rescuer, even to the mighty, even to the weak. God will rescue us. God alone is our salvation, and God alone rescues us from all of our enemies. Now, notice here in verse 3 at the end there, David says, say to my soul, I am your salvation. He says to God, God, say to my soul, speak to my soul, I am your salvation. What is David looking for here? Assurance. 
He is looking for assurance, not just in God's ability to fight and his ability to take up armor, but that God would speak to the very soul of David. Talk to my soul, God, and tell my soul that you will be my salvation. Why will that give him assurance? Because if God speaks, every other voice is silenced. All the voices of his enemies can come against him. The voices that he has in his own head about how terrible he is. All of it is silenced when God says, I am your salvation. David can rest in a promise that is spoken by God and so can you. If God speaks something, rest in that. The peace that surpasses all understanding when God says of you, I will be your salvation. My eternity is set because God has spoken these words. And I hope yours is too. Find me now in verse 4. David continues, and now he's praying against his enemies. He says, let those be ashamed and dishonored who seek my life. Let those be turned back and humiliated who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them on. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hid their net for me, and without cause they dug a pit for my soul. Let destruction come upon him unaware and let the net which he hid catch himself. Into that very destruction, let him fall. Now David is praying against his enemies here. And I want us to pay attention because we will sometimes pray against our enemies and we want to make sure we're doing it according to the will of God, not according to what we want to happen to them. Yes? <clears throat> now so David is praying, shame them, humiliate them. My enemies, those who come against me, those who seek my very life, let them be ashamed, let them be turned back, let them be humiliated. I don't believe there is malice here in the words of David, and I'll explain why a little bit later. But I don't think David is having this wicked intent against them, like crush them, stomp them out, right? Like that's, that's later on in the Psalms. David starts praying stuff like break their teeth, and we're not there yet. We're in the, David's righteous in this one, yeah? But he's praying not that his enemies would be hurt, but that God's justice would be done. These are those who are seeking the life of the righteous. They're seeking to harm the righteous. And basically what David is asking is, God, would you be God? Would you hold justice? Would you defend the righteous? Would you protect the innocent? Would you rescue me? Shame them. Embarrass them. And then he says, let them be like chaff before the wind. And I love that image. So here's a picture for us. This is chaff before the wind. So when they're, they're taking wheat, they kind of pile it all up and they take this winnowing fork. You can kind of see it there. But they, they stick it in and they throw it up in the air and all the wheat which you want to keep falls to the ground and all the chaff which is like the useless husk, it blows away in the wind, right? The wind takes it and it is useless and that's kind of how you separate it. Basically what David is saying here is push these buggers away like that. As easily as the wind takes the chaff, send them out with the angel of the Lord pushing them on. And then he says, this is probably one of the favorite things I've ever seen somebody pray against their enemies. It says, make their way dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. <laughs> Basically what he said is, put these buggers on slip and slide in the dark and send your best for chase them. <laughs> I don't care who you are. You don't want to slip and slide in the dark. You're running from nobody. Let alone the angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord um, is often thought of as Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. We don't have too much evidence here from this text. So I will say this, whether this is Christ or God's chosen angel, basically David is saying, send your best after my enemies. Protect me, Lord, with your best. And God does. Stumble them, make them fall. Let them be pursued by your best because they pursue me without cause. David here is maintaining his righteousness, that he is innocent in this, that they're pursuing him, not because he did something to them, but because they are wicked and evil. He is innocent here. They're pursuing the innocent, and so he's asking again, would you defend me? Now, verse 8 is very powerful, and I want us to see this. It says, let destruction come upon him unaware. Let the net which he hid catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. This is a common thing that we see, not just in scripture, but in life, and that if we start setting up evil for somebody else, it is often that evil that catches us. If we start desiring evil against someone else or praying evil against someone else, it is often that evil that will catch us. Think about Haman, right? He wants to hang Mordecai on this gallows that is super high so everybody can see him. It is on that gallows that that man loses his life. The wickedness and the evil he set up for someone else comes against him, family. I pray that we are aware of this so that we are never seeking evil against someone else. It will come back to haunt us. 
And so he's asking God for all of these things to defend and to, to protect and to visit the evil and to send the angel of the Lord against him. Find me now in verse 9. David says these words, And my soul shall rejoice in the Lord. It shall exult in his salvation. All my bones will say, Lord, who is like you? Who delivers the afflicted from him who is too strong for him and the afflicted and the needy from him who robs him? Rescue me, Lord. Fight for me. Defend me. Send my enemies away and I will rejoice in you. I will praise you. Now, it's weird because we said this is a psalm of lament, right? Pain and suffering and sorrow. But even in the midst of lament, David will say, I will praise you. Now, has David's decision to praise God changed his circumstance at all? No. They're still seeking his life. They still want to kill him. But it has changed David. This is what I'm talking about. In times of suffering and sorrow, there are anchors that we can hold on to. And this is one of them. God, I will praise you. What he's doing is looking forward to the future hope of God's rescue. Meaning God has not rescued him yet, but he trusts that God will. Family, look, when you're going through suffering and trial and pain, or you see the ones you love going through suffering and trial and pain, the easiest thing in the world to do is doubt God. When you ask for deliverance and you do not see it, the easiest thing in the world is to go, bro, what are you doing? Don't you care? Where are you? I thought you were good. But if we can get past that, if we can have anchors to hold on to, that God is still faithful in the struggle, that he still rescues us, we can look to his future hope and deliverance. And in the midst of the craziest storms of our life, we can rescue God. We can, I'm sorry, rescue God. We can worship God. He don't need rescue. But think about those in the early church who were martyred, who on their way to be killed, to be stoned to death, to be burned, were singing his praises because they looked to his future hope. We can do the same. Let us not get so comfortable in our Christianity that we think that a flat tire means we can't rejoice in God. Yeah? We can praise him through all kinds of suffering. He says, I will exalt in you. That word exalt is like excessive uh, jubilation or celebration. It just means super happy, right? Like I will be stoked in you, God, even though rescue has not come. This doesn't fix his situation. It fixes David's heart on the one who will. God will rescue Notice in verse 10, he says, my bones, all my bones will say, Lord, who is like you? This is an anchor for us. That question has one answer. Who is like God? Nobody. <laughs> Super easy answer. Who is like the Lord Almighty? No one. He's saying here, God, you are holy. That's what it means for God to be holy. It means that he is alone. He is separate from all things. He is the only one like him. And that holiness is an anchor for us. Because what it reminds us is only God can do what God can do. I can't trust and I shouldn't trust in anything else. I shouldn't put my hope in anything else because there's only one who is like God and that is God. Why is holiness an anchor for him? Because in the midst of all the craziness in the world, Satan will try to tempt us and distract us with the manini things, the temporal things, the things that aren't going to last forever. But God's holiness remains. When Job lost his mind and started talking smack to God, God reminded Job that he was holy. All the questions he asked Job were to remind him of one thing, that God is holy. And when Job was reminded of that, Job spoke sweet words. I spoke of things that were too wonderful to me. Things that I did not understand. Job is humbled and then God restores him all this other stuff, right? But he had to be reminded of God's holiness. If you can hang on to that, be reminded of that. His holiness is not just something we should fear and, and, and awe at, but it is something that can give us comfort. Because if he says he will rescue, no one can stop him. If he says he will deliver, no one can silence him. When God speaks, everyone else is silenced. He is our rescuer. So again, most of this psalm is lament. Keep looking for these anchors, these things that we can hold on to. Find me in verse 11. David says here of his enemies, malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things I do not know. They repay me evil for good to the bereavement of my soul. So David is so innocent in the situation that all the lies these guys are making up, he doesn't even understand what they're talking about. It's not like they're talking about anything close to what he's done. These are so outlandish and so ridiculous that he is clueless to what they're speaking of. Again, maintaining his innocence. Now, remember I said earlier, David was praying for, against his enemies according to the will of God. I want us to see this here. This is Deuteronomy 19. 
If a malicious witness, like David just said, rises up against the man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. So when David says visit their evil upon themselves, he's not making up his own punishment. He is praying according to the word of God. We ought to do the same. We should pray according to God's will. Now, I was talking to a sister last week. I don't know if she's here or not, but she's from Ukraine. So she was talking about that war and that there are enemies coming against her people. And how do we pray for those enemies, right? We want to pray according to the will of God. Now, it's okay to say what you're feeling, right? It's, it's okay to tell God what's going on in your heart. God, you know how I want to pray for these people. You know what I want to happen to them. You see the anger that is in me. Nevertheless, Lord, teach me how to pray for them as you would. Teach me how to care for them as you would. It's hard, but it is much better than praying your own evil and having it come against you. Amen? Always learn to pray according to the will of God because those prayers are mighty. They're powerful. Find me now in verse 13 and 14. We're going to see how David has treated his enemies. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer kept returning to my bosom. I went about as though it were my friend or brother. I bowed down mourning as one who sorrows for a mother. So David is saying here of those who are his enemies, when they were sick, I went into mourning for them. I put on sackcloth for them. I wept for them. I cared for them as though they were my own mother or brother. And so these people who are his enemies, David has loved them. He has cared for them. And now it's these very people who are coming against him. We're not sure where this psalm is, but the internal evidence would suggest that it's about the time when Saul is hunting him. Especially when you're thinking about these verses, David sat there with his instrument and played so that Saul could have peace. Loved him, and then Saul decided he was gonna throw a spear at him, try to pin him to the wall. Hunt him down. These men that I have loved and cared for, they're speaking ill against me. They're doing all these wicked things against me. It does not change the way that David treats them or even thinks about them. He is caring for his enemies. Now, we've all been in this kind of situation, right? We've loved people, and they've not done well to us. Find me in verse uh, 13. I'm sorry, 15. At my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. The smiters whom I did not know gathered together against me. They slandered me without ceasing. Like godless jesters at a feast, they gnashed their teeth. And so he has treated them with love and compassion and mercy and grace and patience, and they have done wickedness to him. They have spoken evil against him. Now, a lot of us know what this is like. We love someone, we care for them, we pray for them, we make meals for them, and then they speak all kinds of ill about us, right? Your kids. (laughs) I remember doing that to my parents. Talking all nuha and stink about them with my friends, forgetting that they have loved me and cared for me and blessed me, right? But even outside of that, there are people that we have loved and there's just been evil to return. How then do we respond? How do we treat these people? Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Basically what Jesus is saying here is if you only love those people who love you, how are you like Jesus? How are you different from the world? How are you sanctified or set apart if you only love those who love you? It is hard and it is difficult to love our enemies because our immediate thought is they don't deserve it. Neither did we. If we are honest, we did not deserve the love of God, but he was very willing to give it to us. So David's enemies come against him. They spout lies. The very people that he has loved are now hating him. I hope you've been paying attention because a lot of this psalm is actually pointing to Jesus Christ the night that he was betrayed. 
these enemies that come against him, these false witnesses that rise up. They, they seek his life, even though he's only done good to them. Check out this picture here. So Jesus is standing here being judged. That one brother right there is super upset. But there's only one innocent person in this picture. And it is the one who looks like a criminal. Now you want to talk about somebody who was loving and kind and only received evil in return. He is trying to save the very men who are taking his life. He is trying to save the very men who will beat him and whip him and spit on him and dishonor him and disrespect him. He has came to save them from their sin and they return evil upon him. And Jesus is led to slaughter silent like a lamb. He does not speak evil or wish evil against his enemies. He does not try to defend or justify himself. He keeps entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously, like David. David here is going to point to and foreshadow Jesus and how he suffers. Jesus has suffered for us. Now, even all these false testimonies and all these false witnesses, Jesus understands that. When people speak ill about you and say lies about you, Jesus understands it was said when he was in trial, I think it's Matthew 26, Jesus is in trial and they try to gather all these false witnesses and not a one of them can come up with the same lie. They're all just saying all these different things and so they actually can't listen to any of the false witnesses because it's supposed to be a testimony of two or three. There are only two guys who agree and here is their lie. This man said he can destroy the temple of God and raise it up in three days. That's a fact. But what I'm saying is Jesus understands what it means to be innocent, to be blameless, and have enemies speak lies about him. I am saying this so that you understand if that is you, Jesus Christ understands you. You are not alone in this. God is not some distant, far off entity watching you suffer and laughing and giggling. He suffers with you. He gets it and he understands. You do not suffer alone. How can we lament? How can we suffer through these things like Christ? By entrusting ourselves to the one who judges righteously. God is a rescuer. Did he rescue Christ? Yeah. And he will rescue us. He loves and cares for us. Find me now in verse 17. David is going to ask a profound question here. David says, Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue my soul from their ravages. My only life from the lion's. I will give you thanks in the great congregation. I will praise you among a mighty throng. That question, how long are you going to look on? He's basically asking God, how long are you going to keep watching this happen? How long are you, because I know you see. How long will you look on? Now I want you to understand, he is not challenging or accusing God here. This is a cry of a heart that has been suffering and wants to see if there is an end. Lord, how long? And I love that God allows David this grace. God has never failed. He has always proven himself faithful. David knows this and still David is allowed to ask the question, Lord, how long? Again, not accusing, but asking. But here's what's crazy. Even if we challenge God and accuse him, he still allows us that grace. Think of Mary and Martha. Lord, do you not care that my sister is this and I'm this? Think about how ridiculous that statement is. Do you not care? He has literally stepped off the throne of heaven to come down in flesh to save that woman and she's going, don't you care that I'm doing all the chores? <laughs> They're in the boat and the disciples are freaking out. Teacher, rise up. Don't you care that we're perishing? Bro, he's in the boat. Relax. But again, he has come down to save these men and they ask him, don't you care? God allows us the grace to ask those questions. One, because he's not so sensitive that any challenge is going to rile him up. Two, he knows that we're human. Christ took on flesh to understand and know what we're going through. He gets it. And so we can ask, Lord, how long? How long will I go through this? How long will I suffer through these things? Again, not accusing him, but to ask. And God is faithful to answer. And David pleads with God here, Lord, would you rescue me? Would you save me? And then he says, verse 18, I will give you thanks in the great congregation and I will praise you among a mighty throng. God, when you rescue me, I will celebrate you in front of everybody. I will gather everyone together and we will celebrate you. Great deliverance is worthy of great praise. We love watching people get delivered. 
watching people get rescued. That's why all your famous Bible stories are of people being rescued. Think about it, David and Goliath, God rescues Israel via David. Daniel in the lion's den, God rescues him, God delivers him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God rescues them out of the fire. Our favorite story, the cross and the resurrection, we were rescued and delivered from our sin and death. We love stories of deliverance and they deserve praise. Now, when we ask God to deliver us, and he does, often our first instinct is not praise. I pray that our answer is never, oh, it took so long. <laughs> or we'll ask God to deliver us from something and then go, oh, sweet, and then go do something else. Go chase our dreams or our goals. Well, now that this isn't a distraction for me, I can go do what I want to do. If we are asking God to deliver us, and he is the only one who can, when he delivers us, our first response ought to be, thank you. Praise you, God. And then we tell everybody what's going on so that they can celebrate with us. Great deliverance deserves great praise. Think about the favorite testimonies, the ones that are powerful, the ones that you remember. It's all about somebody being delivered, right? Years of addiction or lies of the enemy or hurt from someone else that God has delivered them from. I have forgiven this person though they've hurt me my whole life. Like those are the ones that we remember because people are delivered. People are rescued. And when those things stir up in us, we ought to praise God. Spurgeon says this of this verse, most men publish their griefs. Good men should proclaim their mercies. What this means is most people will complain and yada, yada, yada about what they're going through. Good people should proclaim the mercies of God when they have been given mercy, when they have been given grace, and then we should celebrate and talk about those things. Imagine how much the church would change if when we came together, when we talked about things in our small group, rather than complaining, we just talked about what God is doing. Now, I'm not saying hide your strife and your grief. Please share those things so that we can pray, but I'm saying less complaining, more celebrating. I wonder how that would change us. More praising, more talking about what God has delivered us from rather than what he has yet to deliver us from. Praising and worshiping God, it changes something in us. Verse 19, David prays again against his enemies. Do not let those who are wrongfully my enemies rejoice over me nor let those who hate me without cause wink maliciously, for they do not seek peace. I'm sorry, speak peace. But they devise deceitful words against those who are quiet in the land. They open their mouth wide against me. They say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. You have seen it, O Lord. Do not keep silent. O Lord, do not be far from me. David is asking God here, God, see my enemies and do not let them celebrate a victory over me. Silence their joy for my struggle and for my failing. They're full of strife and deceit and they deserve no peace. And then he says, keep them from winking maliciously or winking the eye. Now that is kind of lost in us because it's not the same context that we have, right? They're not going, how's it, David? <laughs> the winking of the eye in scripture is always a sinful thing. It is always, there's malice or pride or rebellion against God. It is a wicked and evil gesture. And so keep them from even making that gesture. Keep me from all of their evil. And then it says they opened their mouth and they said, yes, we've seen it. We've caught you. We've seen you do this. Now, for those of you who have siblings or cousins, you know how frustrating this is when they go run and tell mom some lie about something that you did and then you got to run behind them and go, no, mom, I never. And they're going, yes, I seen him do it. And go, mom, no, I didn't. And mom didn't see nothing. So you know you're about to catch cracks and you're fighting for your life like, I promise, I didn't do it. And they're going, yes, I seen him do it. That is one of the most helpless situations that you can be in. You have no hope because there was no witness for you except the person who's lying. And so here David is experiencing this. All these enemies are going, we saw him do it. We saw him with this evil. David says, God, you have seen it. My enemies can speak all the lies that they want. God, you have seen the truth. Family, you do not need to justify yourself before your enemies. You do not need to defend yourself before your enemies. If you are innocent like David is here, there's no need to justify. There's no need to defend. God has seen you. And when you pray to him, remind yourself of that. Lord, they have said all these things about me, but you have seen me. You know me. And how good it is that God not only sees our righteousness, he keeps our righteousness. God is a rescuer, even from the lies of the enemy. And even now, as Satan stands before him to lie and, and accuse us, God stands and he sees us. And he sees us as his son. If 
we believe in him. Find me now in verse 23. David asks, Lord, stir up yourself and awake to my right and to my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, according to your righteousness and do not let them rejoice over me. Do not let them say in their heart, aha, our desire. Do not let them say we have swallowed him up. Let those be ashamed and humiliated all together who rejoice at my distress. Let those be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves over me. He's praying again against his enemies. Come to my rescue, God. Save me from these things. And then David says something bold in verse 24. He says, judge me. That is a bold statement to make to an almighty and holy God. Judge me, O Lord. Notice, according to your righteousness. Not according to my righteousness. Judge me, Lord, according to your righteousness. Because in that judgment, David will be found blameless. It is the same for you and I. If we are found in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, judge me, Lord, according to your righteousness, and he shall. And we will be found innocent and blameless. Not just positionally. We are positionally righteous before God. If you believe that Jesus Christ has died for your sins, if you trust in him alone for salvation, when you die, you will stand in Jesus Christ's righteousness. That is positional righteousness. I'm talking about practical righteousness. Meaning David is not engaged in ongoing sin here. He's not lying or cheating or stealing and then saying, well, yeah, I'm positionally righteous, but I got some stuff going on. He is practically righteous. And to be righteous that way, to know that there is no active sin, no pursuant sin in your life, and to come before God is such a blessing. It is such a blessing to be able to come before him and not have to go, I'm sorry again. I'm back again. Now, we all have to go through that time. We all have to go through that season, and sometimes we go through it a couple times. But to know that you are learning and living a righteous life, pursuing God, it is such a beautiful thing to come before him and go, God, you see me. Judge me. You see me that I am righteous. And I pray that we can pray that prayer often. Verse 25 and 26 are powerful. Do not let them say in their heart our desire. Do not let them say we have swallowed him up. Let those be ashamed and humiliated altogether who rejoice in my distress. Let those be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves over me. Let them shout for joy and rejoice who favor my vindication. Let them say continually, the Lord be magnified who delights in the prosperity of his servants. And my tongue shall decree your righteousness and your praise all day long. He's asking for vindication. Take away my guilt. Show that I am innocent, right? Take away the blame. Now even this, right, vindication, this is something that we love to see. If you've ever seen a movie where there's like an innocent person who gets put in jail and then some lawyer way down the road comes and wants to review his case and finds out that he's innocent and they fight in the courtroom and they get all this evidence and there's all these people trying to keep them down and they're sitting in the courtroom and there's one person accusing him and they're fighting for his life and they get all this evidence and they prove his innocence and then the guy who's been accusing him is silenced and the judge says, you are cleared of all charges and he bangs the gavel and the, ju- the, the courtroom goes wild and he cries and the people hug him. We celebrate because he's been vindicated. The innocent has been found innocent. Justice has been done and we love this. And this is why David is saying, Lord, vindicate me. Vindicate me. Separate me from all the guilt, all the lies. Show me righteous and I will praise you. I will worship you. I will rejoice in you. We should celebrate when people are vindicated. Justice has been done. We can rejoice with them. Now God rescues the just and the righteous. And he does this by making them just and righteous. We're talking about David against his enemies and how he treated them. We're talking about how we ought to love our enemies. The question I want to ask us is, how did God love us when we were enemies? Because scripture tells us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still enemies of God, Christ died for us. How then are we to love our enemies? The way that Christ did especially if we understand the only reason we are just and righteous is because God has made us this way. He has saved us. He has blessed us. He has redeemed us. This psalm is pointing us to Jesus and his experience the night he was betrayed and we get to see what real love looks like, what it means to lament well, to suffer well, and we can learn how to suffer like Christ. Family, scripture promises that we will suffer in this world. How we suffer is a whole different thing. 
suffer well. Suffer with Christ. I do not promise you a life free of suffering, of joy, of peace, and having your dreams fulfilled. I do not make you those promises because scripture does not make you those promises. We will suffer with Christ, but the promise is none of our suffering is wasted and that one day all suffering will end. Christ will put an end to it. No more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. And so while we are here, yes, we will suffer. But Christ has suffered with us. He understands and he will take it away. He suffered on the cross so that he could associate with the hurting, the lowly, those who have suffered. If you're here today and you feel like you've been suffering without God or that God has been silent or absent in your suffering or your prayers, I encourage you to look to this psalm. Look to Jesus. See that Christ has not abandoned you if you are his child. Aloha, I'm Matt Kaufman, the marketing director here at the Kaka'ako campus. I wanna say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you were inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so you can keep up to date with all the things that are happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our study through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you've made a decision to follow Christ today, we encourage you to click on our I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of our website and fill out a form so we can stay connected. One last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There you will find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha.